Assalamualaikum uh, everyone. Um, we're going to speed through this so that we don't take too much time as well. My name is Mali Hazia. I'm the Associate Director of Legal Aid Society. Uh, we're very lucky to have a great eminent uh, panel today who I'd like to invite up on stage. I'd like to start with inviting Justice Nasra Iqbal to the stage. Uh, although she begs very little introduction, uh, she is one of the first senior female judges of the Pakistan High Court. She is a law professor and has served as, uh, she was a justice in the Lahore High Court from 1994 to 2002. She has a degree in international property law from Punjab Universities and a master's of law from Harvard University. Uh, she is a professor at the Qaidi Azam Law College and the School of Law. She has been the president of the Lahore High Court Bar Association and a member of the Pakistan Law and Justice Commission. She has been awarded the Satara Imtiaz. She has been awarded uh, the Wonder Woman Award. She has been awarded the Fatma Jinnah Medal Award. And she is a great inspiration to all of us female lawyers and male lawyers across Pakistan. So Madam, well, I would love to welcome you to the panel. I would next like to invite Justice Ali Bakir Najfi, who is a Pakistani jurist and a senior judge of the Lahore High Court since 2012. He is a member of the Administration Committee of the Lahore High Court. Uh, in his life before a judge, he was one of the most prominent lawyers in Punjab and was a professor at the Punjab University Law College for over 12 years. During the course of his legal profession, he has conducted a large number of cases before the lower courts, Federal Chariot Court and the High Court and the Supreme Court. Since his elevation to the High Court, he has decided more than 18,000 cases of many, many different kinds as well as been on many inquiries. In particular, I would like to mention his recent judgment of uh, Madasa Shah, where he particularly uh, I think single-handedly reignited the UK and Pakistan protocol on the cases of abduction of children. Thank you so much for joining us, Justice Najfi. I'd then like to invite Dr. Kadir Alam, who is the AIG of prison in Punjab. He has an LLM in criminal law and criminal justice, and his PhD thesis focused on death row phenomena. Uh, he is a published author in various recognized journals and two blogs published as well, currently working at the AIG prisons at the Home Department of the Government of Sindh. Uh, he is responsible for a wide variety of changes within the prison systems, which we're very anxious and looking forward to hearing today. Uh, Dr. Kadhi, we'd like to welcome you to the panel. And last, I'd like to invite Mr. Zavid Mehmood who has worked as the Office of the United Nations of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva since 2008. He is the Human Rights Officer Lead of the Implementation of the UN Commission Position on Incarceration. He also advises on drug policy and human rights. He represents, represents the OHCHR, the UN Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice in Vienna. He is also a member of the UN Task Force on Drug-Related Matters and the UN Follow-up and Coordination Mechanism on the common position of incarceration established by the Executive Committee of the Secretary General. From 2008 until 2017, he was the advisor on the abolition of the death penalty and also works on the Commission of Inquiry, Witness and Victim Protection and other accountability related issues. Uh, so we would like to welcome you to Pakistan and welcome you to this panel in particular. Um, I will not go into too many details. I had a nice long introduction planned, which nobody will want to hear given the paucity of time. So very briefly, I want to emphasize that the prison situation in Pakistan has become very, very dire. Overcrowding has, Pakistan, the latest statistics roughly say we are 134% over the capacity of prisons in Pakistan. There are various reasons for this, whether we are talking about reasons for law, uh, the recent law reform and the impact it has had, the pre-trial processes which have led to long-term incarceration, whether we are talking about the socioeconomic factors which contribute to a larger number of people being in, position, uh, in prison who are from a lower economic background. But suffice it to say, efforts have been made in, over the course of years, whether we talk about the national judicial making policy, whether we talk about the model courts that were done under Justice Kosa, whether we're talking about the Sindh government's committee of prisoners, which has worked for over 25 years in providing free legal aid, 
whether we are talking about mediation and alternative dispute resolution that Justice Mansoor talked about uh, in his opening remarks, trying to talk about deviation from the courts. But needless to say, the problem still persists. So I'd like to turn over to the esteemed panel, and starting with you, Justice Nasra, if uh, you have a few words to say about it. In your opinion, what are the drivers and why, simply why are the prisons overcrowded? <laughs> why are the prisons in Pakistan so overcrowded? And what are the problems that come from it? Most of the so-called offenders are actually incarcerated because they have to be put somewhere. And they put them in the prison. And the prisons don't have that kind of capacity. And once they are in the prison, they forget about where they are. And they just stay there. After that, they've turned off my mic. <laughs> Apologies for the electronic mix-up. So, Justice Nasra, what you're saying is that due to the lack of other alternative uh, sources or places or institutions to place potentially incarcerated persons or persons under trial, uh, they have been sent into prison and forgotten about. In one and way. they are not supposed to be incarcerated with the under trial uh, with the convicted prisoners. But the convict and the under trial, they are all kept in the same place. So there's very little chance of justice emerging in this kind of situation. All right, thank you so much, madam. Um, Zavid Saab, I'd like to turn to you a little bit. Now, overcrowding is an issue that is seen internationally. What are some of the solutions that other countries or internationally have been looked at um, and have been successful to a certain extent? Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Malia, for asking me this question. But before that, I would like to uh, thank uh, AGA's Legal Aid Sale, Asma Jahangir Foundation, and other organizers to inviting me to address this conference for the second time. I was here in 2018, first Asma Jahangir Conference, uh, is speaking on the abolition of death penalty on that conference. So this is my second time, and I'm pleased to be here. That. Before I start speaking on uh, responding to your question, I would like to mention my connection with Asma Jahangir. I would like to pay tribute to her. She was my teacher, mentor, friend, and debater with me. In many occasions, we debated on different, different issues. We had a disagreement. One example I would like to give when she came to uh, Afghanistan, I was their uh, legal advisor to the UN special representative. Uh, for Afghanistan, we invited her to come as a special reporter on summary execution. So we were discussing about what we can recommendation she should have in her report. Uh, I was pushing one thing very much, that ratification of International Criminal Court by Afghanistan. Afghanistan went through such a disaster situation, serious uh, crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Afghanistan deserved better. So she was arguing with me, is it really possible to do that by Afghanistan? No Asian country so far has done, only one Philippine ratified that uh, treaty. But at the end, she accepted and went to President Karzai, recommended, and within three months' time, we received that uh, ratification by the Afghan government and ICC. Now we have a case, a preliminary case against Afghanistan in the ICC. So there, through debate, we reached some consensus, always that was I learned from her, that how to work in this international environment. Coming back to your point, that uh, we have seen, as Madam mentioned, uh, Honorable Judge mentioned about prison overcrowding is happening because of uh, those people shouldn't be in the prison. Who are those people we are talking about? We have done l little research recently, and I would like to show you that first, uh, uh, this report, I have here a copy for all of you, 
and in the report it is about human rights challenges with regard to drug offenses or drug problem as a whole over all over the world there is a one thing we found the one of the key human rights challenges is a prison overcrowding by drug related offenses all over the world almost one fifth prison population now around 11 million people in the world detained or incarcerated all over the world for drug related offenses among these uh, 11 people incarcerated among them 20 percent for drug related offenses here you will see one data uh, i put here the 20 percent drug offenses among these 20 percent 61 percent for a small possession of drugs i had the opportunity last week to had a discussion with uh, Prison, uh, Assistant Inspector General and also ja uh, Prosecutor G General from Lahore in a conference in uh, Islamabad organized by Just Justice Project Pakistan on drug laws and problem with the drug laws. I learned to, I also learned from that conference that similar problem you have in Pakistan that 20 percent, exactly 19.6 percent prison population convicted, not convicted, incarcerated, large number of them under pretrial detention for drug-related offenses. And this is one of the issues we have noticed that those countries who try to decriminalize the personal position, number of prison population has decreased tremendously. Let me give you one example. In last two years back, Ghana, one of our commonwealth country, Ghana, they removed criminal, uh, from the criminal law, possession of drugs for personal use, that one. Small drugs and all these things, they removed from the, their law. And that contributed to reduction of the prison population tremendously. We, I just sent a message this morning to my con colleague in a post foundation, what is the situation now? They mentioned that the prison population decreased almost 33% prison population after the changes in the legislation. I'd like to give you another example. Tunisia, the pretrial detention. We discussed about the pretrial detention contribute uh, to the prison overcrowding. Madam mentioned that pretrial detention people should not be that long time for pretrial detention. In Tunisia, we did a one research in 2015 after the Arab Spring uh, and on the prison system, prison situation. One of the key reasons found, we found uh, one of the key reasons of the prison population, uh, increased prison population is the pretrial detention, i.e. or other way we could call that non billable offenses. That. So large number of people in the prison because of non billable offenses, pretrial detention center. So we work with the prison uh, legislative authority of uh, Tunisia and just only one small amendment in the legislation to removing the mandatory words from the legislation contributed to reduction of the prison population. The no longer is it mandatory that because of the drug offenses or because of the protest, public protest and all these offenses, they have to be in the prison without any trial we don't know when going to be the trial, but those small changes yielded a result. Last point I would like to mention, uh, another example I would like to give, that is the criminalization of poverty. And that is one of the key concern for us. And we have noticed that this criminalization of poverty, Vagrancy Act, we have that in my country, in Bangladesh also, we have the colonial legislation in whole uh, commonwealth uh, jurisdiction, we have seen this kind of act, act for a homelessness. Those pity crimes need to be removed from the legislation to avoid this prison overcrowding in the system. Thank you. Maybe I'll come back with other. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Zavid Saab. I think that's, it's very inspiring to hear uh, you know, examples from other nations where we have been able to successfully implement, uh, you know, things such as this. Uh, Justice Najfi, if I may come to you uh, next. 
looking at some of these examples and even from uh, Pakistan's history as well. Do you th would you be able to illuminate uh, your perspectives on w if we're looking at bail reform or even if we're looking at legal reform uh, as, as Abid Saab was talking about in Justice Nastra where we reduce mandatory pretrial detention or we re re reduce criminal penalties. Do you think that that would have an impact on uh, prison crowding or overcrowding, all of that? So would you like to speak from there or from here? Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, the reforms in the criminal justice system so as to reduce the incarceration in the jails of different prisoners. Uh, it's an admitted position that in our jails the, uh, there's overcrowding of the prisoners. Under trial prisoners are about 65% occupants in jail and the UTPs are either of minor offenses or offenses falling in the prohibitory clause of Section 497 CRPC, more than seven years imprisonment or maybe of life imprisonment. As our distinguished uh, participant was mentioning that uh, it's correct that in our jails, many of the imprison of the under trial prisoners are charged of uh, uh, narcotics, possessing narcotics of different volume. We have also prisoners in the jail who are facing charges of offenses against property. These uh, uh, overcrowding in the prisons can be reduced by adopting certain measures. Number one, we should encourage a system in which the trial should be concluded expeditiously. And for that, we should employ and employ the modern techniques of uh, digitization. The modern IT equipment should be applied to ascertain the uh, benchmark, minimum benchmark, which is required for the disposal of system of the cases. Number two, we should sensitize our judges that liberty of an individual is very precious. And our bail granting parameters, which are fluctuating from case to case basis, should be applied according to the given situation. There are instances in which uh, the offenses, the police, unfortunately, involve certain prisoners, such certain uh, citizens of this kind of our society owing to some uh, feuds or owing to some uh, animosity. In that situation, we can understand the judge should be, should a police officer is, prosecution is there. So all the stakeholders are there. They can think over, okay, how the prison population can be reduced, especially the under trial prisoners. And one more important thing that is related to the District Criminal Justice Committee that is purely related to the District and Session Judge. District and Session Judge pay visit to the district jail of his or her jurisdiction and he releases the prisoner on the pet involved in petty crime. Uh, I collected the data of 2023. Total uh, about 10,000 prisoners were released by the visitors of the district and session judges. And majority of them, 99% are involved in section 9A of CNSA. So well, you, my experience working on the criminal side is that the most of the cases pouring in into our judicial system are for the grant of bails. As Madam Nasser has pointed out, very rightly so, that in our jail, we have seen so many prisoners who should not have been sent to the jail at the first instance. Their cases are false. They are politically motivated. They are uh, prison act based on vengeance, animosity, or feud. 
and sometime the uh, offenses are uh, of such a nature that uh, the police is in the habit of involving it just to show their efficiency. So in these like situation, I think the law of bail is uh, very much available to a judge, which he should exercise whenever so demanded. Uh, well, answer to your question is this, my paper is already there, but I will not have the time to see that. But perhaps answer to any question, uh, I will dial it upon. Thank you. Apologies, sir. I'm hoping that we will still have time for more uh, detailed discussion. Um, so, Dr. Kadir sir, so we've heard suggestions where Justice Nasra talked about the importance of recognizing the humanity and the rights of dignity uh, of prisoners so that they are not just forgotten in prison, whether they, you know, they're rightfully or wrongfully incarcerated. Uh, we've heard the international examples of whether we're talking about Ghana or Tunisia, where uh, people who've been incarcerated for minor crimes or drug abuse or you know, drug handling, which things that we see over here, whether I mean, we've had large incarcerations for beggary or vag vagrancy, et cetera. And we've had Justice Najfi talked about the importance of particularly giving bail and the judge's responsibility for making sure that anyone who the police may arbitrarily, arbitrarily arrest, uh, the importance of the focus on ensuring that person's liberty. Now, in your experience, in your vast experience with the prison administration in Punjab, what have been some of the successful models that you have applied uh, to successfully reduce um, some of the prison population? And what do you think in the larger criminal justice uh, system, what are the things that should or can be applied in Pakistan? So please, would you like to come over here? Yes, and I think uh, the presentation. Yes, can we put on the presentation, please? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, before I uh, answer to this uh, particular question, just to give you the brief. Uh, uh, in prison, whatever is there that is sent by the court, mean by by the order of the court through the commitment warrant. So whatever is inside the jail, that is the indicator of the criminal justice system, mean performance indicator of the prison system. Uh, just for the general knowledge, for the, all the audience, criminal justice system uh, comprises of police and judiciary, prosecution, prisons, and probation and parole. So uh, as far as the prison authorities are concerned, they have no uh, jurisdiction to reduce uh, any uh, overcrowding, especially in the case of under trial prisoners. Uh, as uh, you must know, we have two laws that is governing the prison affairs in Punjab, rather than in Pakistan. The first law that is uh, um, Prison Act 1894, and the second law that is a Prisoners Act 1900. So under Section 3 of the Prisoners Act, whatever the person is committed to the jail, the superintendent jail cannot refuse to take that person on the basis of overcrowding. It was happening before this promulgation of this act in 1894 that prison authorities can refuse, okay, we are not going to keep this person due to the overcrowding. So this authority was with the government. For the moment, we have no authority to, okay, to reduce the under trial prisoners. Okay, so as far as uh, the reduction of the overcrowding, but the Punjab prison have taken the steps uh, we have constructed the 12 new jails. And uh, obviously it has uh, reduced the capacity, rather it enhanced the capacity and reduced the overcrowding. Uh, next important thing, which I can suggest, what the prison authorities can are doing, yeah, which have done to reduce the overcrowding of the convicted prisoners, we have uh, the system of the parole. We have, uh, we award the remissions. Remissions mean the ordinary remission, the education remission, and the special remissions. And the prison authorities uh, manage the fine of the prisoners who cannot pay the fine 
and can manage to the payment of Arsh, Daman and Dia because without payment of the Arsh and Daman, Dia prisoner cannot be released. So, what the suggestions can be given to the criminal justice system? Because prison overcrowding cannot be reduced without reforming the criminal justice system. The, my, my first uh, suggestion that is uh, to improve the working of the Criminal Justice Coordination Committee. Under the police rule 2002, there is a Criminal Justice Coordination Committee and uh, this committee is the district based and the district and session judge is there, subordinate jail is there, district police officer is, prosecution is there. So all the stakeholders are there. They can think over, okay, how the prison population can be reduced, especially the under trial prisoners. And one more important thing that is related to the District Criminal Justice Committee that is purely related to the district and session judge. District and session judge pay visit to the district jail of his or her jurisdiction and he releases the prisoner on the pet involved in petty crime. Uh, I collected the data of 2023. Total uh, about 10,000 prisoners were released by the visitors of the district and session judges. And majority of them, 99% are involved in section 9A of CNSA. So, and if I go to the, how many are the recidivists and repeaters? So 80% are the recidivists. So this population, if we, if we are ready to uh, comply the best standards, the best practices, the drug addicts must not send to the jail. And this is, they be, must be considered as a drug, I mean, as a patient. And under the CNSA section 52 and the 53, it's the responsibility of the government to establish rehabilitation center. So this 10,000 population of under trial prisoner can be reduced from the Punjab prisons. The next my suggestion uh, is, uh, if we, the last time, just one month ago, we conducted the survey on the financial status of the prisoners. So 90% prisoners confined in the Punjab prisons belong to the lower strata of the society. And obviously they have not the facility of the competent and effective legal counsel. So in this regard, so this uh, different organization of uh, uh, of the lawyers can play very active roles and prison authorities have engaged and trying to engage the philanthropists to provide the facility of what we call it the pro bono. And recently we, we, have, a we have signed an MOU uh, between Lums Law School and we have launched the this uh, program of paralegals. And what is the paralegals? Paralegals, they are providing legal education to the uh, um, uh, to the prisoners and uh, first the students learn and then students uh, teach the prisoners the how to file the bail how to file uh, this uh, appeal and the basic thing so the last thing which would be not the least uh, under section 53 we have 10 type of the punishments so it is a general and the popular theory that the prison doesn't work. And now the criminal justice system has switched over to alternative to the imprisonment. And what are the alternative to imprisonment mean towards the community sentencing? Mean the prison should be taken as a lost resort, not the first priority. But in our case, we are taking the prison to, we would love to send everybody behind the bars. But this is not the solution. The solution is in the minor cases uh, and the juveniles, we have already Juvenile Justice System Act 2018 under section nine and 10, there is a role of Juvenile Justice Committee, but unfortunately it is not a functional. So that committee can divert, I mean, if somebody is a founder guilty, he should be awarded the minor punishment, the reprimand or the fine. So. There are different models of the community sentencing as well. So we can adopt those models. So just only need to, uh, what we can say, a commitment to reform the criminal justice system. So thank you very much.